everyone and welcome back to Book Club. Um, I'm delighted to be here with the wonderful Diljeet Bachu. Um, she is a musician, an educator, a researcher, an activist, um, and recently co-hosted the wonderful Decolonizing the Musical University conference. Um, we're so happy to have you with us, Diljeet. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, your relationship with research and community music to start us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, first of all, for having me. I'm really excited to do this and um, to have a chance to work uh, with Town Castle. It's always fun. Um, so I am, um, in terms of my relationship with research, I guess we'll work backwards a little bit. So I've just recently finished my PhD, uh, which looked in part at community, community music um, and looking at how community music and primary school music um, have similarities looking at the roles of teachers and facilitators and how they differ and overlap um, and kind of within a wider frame of that was interested in access to music education in formal and non-formal and informal settings and how the people who lead and facilitate those situations um, kind of mediate that access prior to that and kind of I guess the reason I ended up looking at that for a PhD was because prior to starting my PhD in 2014, um, I had spent a few years working in community music um, as a new music graduate, a performance graduate um, and research graduate. Um, and I, I say M a lot, don't I? Um, <laughs> I know, and uh, I had found myself in a few situations where I was, facilitating or being asked to facilitate community music activities um, that I had been around a lot of practice but I myself never did any community music training in a formal sense mm. and I started questioning what so there was a few questions and these basically became the PhD questions and they were what makes people think I have the knowledge to do this work to facilitate musical learning um what barriers do I think I face in terms of looking at my skill set as a musician and as a as a fairly proficient musician at that point um what it, what are the barriers what is it that I think I need to know about teaching or facilitating to work in that setting but also I was all, at that point I think I was coming up against a lot of um I guess conversations as an early career person, they're going, oh, why don't you just go and do some teaching? Or why don't you just, you know, why don't you pop into my nursery and teach some music? And I'm like, you know, having those conversations about specialist skill sets. Um, and so I was really interested in, yeah, these assumptions about both from professional music educators and facilitators and community musicians, assuming that being around a practice would mean I could deliver activities and facilitate that process but also from non-specialists and mm. their assumptions that they hold about what enables someone to teach music um, so that's kind of really where I came at that from and then in terms of getting into community music itself as I say I was a new graduate um, had never really done anything like that before but I always had an interest in education and it was just through a kind of serendipitous meeting which is also part of the PhD was like let's look at chance and um, it was a very much by chance encounter with a community music organization um, who then invited me along to some workshops I got involved just as someone who was there to as a guest and then got invited back for paid work mm. so that was kind of my journey into it and then I stayed with that for probably about three or four years and then phased into the PhD and started asking some of these questions. So that's Wonderful. my relationship with research um, and community music in a nutshell. My research has always been about access to education and that's what I was doing before community music came into my life. And then I've kind of brought the two together in the past five, six years. Brilliant. And I think so much of what you just said will ring true for other community musicians out there. We all seem to take this kind of path to end up in community music and the the actual focus training courses for community music are quite few and far between these days so really interesting to hear a little bit of your journey there as well um, I'm just going to give the people watching a little quick intro into the book club itself um, the point of this book club is to just try and make some of the amazing research that's out there 
accessible for community musicians who might not have time to do the reading or might struggle with just deciphering some of the academic language and the idea is that we're here to have a chat and discover some exciting new research together that Dilji has um, selected for us. So if any of you are watching this and are in the live chat, please do ask questions, make comments based on your own experiences and Dilji and I will be here to answer and get involved. Um, and no question is too simple, no thought is too obvious, just dive straight in there because this is all about all of us learning together and finding our way through together regardless of what stage of our careers we're at. So bearing that in mind, we're going to introduce today's book that Dilji selected for us. So this is by Juliet Hess and it's called Music Education for Social Change, Constructing an Activist Music Education. Um, I can't think of anything more exciting to dive into today. Dilji, can you tell us a little bit about why you've selected this book and the chapter we're going to be delving into? Yes. So this wonderful book um, came out just last year, actually. Um, and I met Juliet, I was fortunate to meet Juliet at a conference a few years back, um, right at the point when I was talking about a lot of these issues I've just mentioned around um, teacher education, professional education, vocational education of musicians, community musicians, practitioners, facilitators, um, and really thinking about some of these questions around how to prepare people for working in various music education contexts. Um, Juliet herself is involved in teacher education in North America. Um, and so the book um, is based on interviews and research she did with 20 people who are defined as activist musicians, which is something I'm kind of finding myself, um, I've always considered myself an activist and now I consider, and now I'm very aware of how my activism feeds into my musical life and my sort of education and research lives as well. So the book really kind of speaks to me, I guess, in that sense that it's about merging identities and, and finding ways forward. Um, but in terms of the question, so Juliet for me is someone who's been um, really at the forefront of addressing race in music education contexts and using critical race theory um, and finding, I guess, really working in a sort of very proactive way to find ways forward for change um, and I think the the book for me really speaks to the links between community music and music education in the sense that a lot of community music is rooted in addressing inequality it's rooted in social justice activism and work um, and anti-oppression work and therefore the notion of an activist music education for me seems to be one that draws on a lot of the philosophies and underpinnings of the work we do in community music an inclusive practice and taking that into maybe a more formal music education approach but also what we consider to be music education so there's some questions around you know is what we are doing part of a, a new vision for music education that is more socially just mm -hmm. and more perhaps historically um, and historic and traditional formats of music education um, so the book um, is set out largely drawing on the work that Juliet's done with these 20 activists um, and it covers, I mean, it covers a lot of ground um, in terms of um, the potential for music, looking at music education as a form of connection. I know connection is huge in community music. So, you know, um, and I know that um, Hannah, when we were both looking at the chapters going, which chapter will we look at here? <laughs> you know, really could have picked any one of these. Um, it's about, you know, looking at shared experience, shared lived experience, honouring lived experience. Um, put the political, bringing the political into music education um, and really yeah for me the book's about finding, thinking about ways forward mm. and I think that's that it's a really sort of practical nature to what the book prompts us to think about in yeah, relation to our practice. Thank you and the chapter we're going to be looking at is the dangers of activist music education um, shall I launch straight in to the the first quote and shall we get started on it? Yes, I think the first quote kind of sums up why I picked the chapter, I guess. Yeah, let's go for Brilliant. it. Let's do it. So the chapter starts off with this quote from Foucault. And he says, my point is not that everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous. Um, so before we all get really freaked out and stop doing community music <laughs> for fear of harming the people we're working with, can we have a little chat about 
what does this mean on the ground in reality and community music? What does this look like in a session if we're thinking everything has the potential to be dangerous that we're doing? Yeah. Well, I think, I think what Foucault says about it not being bad, I think there's something when we think of danger, we think bad. Mm. When actually, um, and this is something I've noticed a lot in recent months, particularly, like you just said, that, that, that fear of going, oh gosh, we should stop what we're doing because we're not doing it right. Um, when actually what this is a call to do, really, or a call of awareness around the fact, it's just about risk, really, for me. It's about the, um, the need to be aware that whatever we're doing, um, if it's not about doing, thing, doing bad things, it's about doing risky things and being aware about what the potential risks are of what we do. And I think in community music, we are always doing risk assessment because often we're working with um, communities of people who are um, who face vulnerabilities and adversity so we, it's not like we're new to risk assessment it's just being aware of the different types of risks in different contexts and kind of taking that to another level mm. um, and really thinking about the realities of how we enact an equitable practice um, mm. Really thinking, of, I guess, in the sense about baggage that we bring in terms of our intention, which yeah. I guess ties into the other the other excerpts that I that, I, that stuck out to me. Um, I guess a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment draws a lot on looking at intention versus reception and experience of those who, on the receiving end, um, and preparedness, which was a big theme in my research and and my experience was how prepared are we for the work we're doing? Mm. And I suppose that ties into this idea you just articulated of the intention versus the reception it really emphasizes how everyone's perception of a piece of music is completely different and there was a part of this chapter that spoke about how music isn't just an aesthetic thing there's humanity within music practice there's an essence of humanity in it always and my experience of a piece of music might be fundamentally different to yours and so whatever I bring to that session, I might think, oh, this is just a song from my childhood, which I love, and I'm going to share it with this group now. I might have these feelings of love and nostalgia and happiness connected to it. For someone else, it could be a complete trigger point because of a different mm -hmm. set of memories, a different set of baggage. And I suppose the thing to remember is that every single person in that room is a unique individual with a unique history, a unique set of experiences, which is going to impact on the engagement within the workshop. Yeah, and I think absolutely that idea that music can have different impacts that aren't always positive um, is a huge thing. It reminds me um, of one of my um, colleagues when I was doing my PhD, uh, Joy Van Vicari, um, who also, I guess, has a relationship with community music as well. Um, was you know looking at what are those what are the other sides of those emotional experiences with music that aren't always it's, it's moving away from this music fixes everything model mm -hmm. because when we think about what joy's research looks at is how we use music to regulate emotions and yet somehow we're aware that we use music you know i'm sure everyone has like their wallow playlist when they're having a like a, a bit of a day where they just want to sit and listen to music and have a cry or yeah. hide under the duvet and we are familiar with that in terms of our everyday engagement as listeners but we don't necessarily think um or are, it's not always at the front of our minds when we're doing education or community work that music in those settings might have a similar impact mm. you know absolutely and i i really want to um just take a moment to think about what you said in terms of remembering that music doesn't necessarily fix everything and we do sometimes have a tendency to be like music is this wonderful magical thing and it heals the world's problems and um you know it brings people together and yes sometimes it does but not always and every situation is different and if music has this exceptionally positive power it also can potentially have a negative power as well. It can be divisive, it can be hierarchical. I'm sure that most people can think of that one musical experience when they were younger in their education that makes them cringe when they look back on it because they might have felt ostracized or criticized in front of a group of people. And 
So we have to remember that music itself comes with baggage, mm -hmm. as well as us as human beings. So you put all of that together, there's no way of being able to anticipate what different trigger points might be for different people. And I think in terms of, again, coming back to that idea of, are we doing bad things by doing what we're doing? I think it's just important in that to remember that that that's part of assessing our intention that our intention can be brilliant but we also have to consider the baggage of what we're bringing in with that yeah. um for example you know intention to do a really positive session but then if we don't apply the same risk assessment to the music we choose or how we deliver it then it, it can counteract the good intention yeah in a way you know and that it's not to say that you're that anyone's a bad person for doing that but it's just about the awareness yeah um you know and that but also i think with that like i'm very much like a learning person like a, everyone is always learning person mm -hmm. um and so i don't think it should ever be something that makes people go oh i need to stop doing this but the more we ask these questions the more we can be more critical about what we're doing more self-aware um and better our practice yeah absolutely. you know that's that's the way forward is to to look at this stuff we now have frames of reference and language to unpack this stuff yeah you know absolutely and to know that it's okay to talk about your insecurities going into a particular piece of work or a particular setting and that it's actually good to talk about that with other people and accept that within our community music community if you like that we are all at different stages of learning and we should be here to support each other with that i think especially community music as well like that's the type of space that we are working so hard to create support in our work <laughs> that we need to apply it to our own professional sort of development world as well mm -hmm. that notion of of supporting a learning process um when I've been teaching, um, I learned from a great colleague um, who I did some team teaching with and, and in his first class is a course on genders, which is obviously complex, and messy, and everyone's coming in with different levels of prior knowledge. Um, and the first thing he says is, we're all going to make mistakes in this class. Yeah. You know, every, we, go, we don't learn anything until we make mistakes. So I think it's, it's embracing that sort of... Um, that's part of the danger, that's part of the risk, isn't it? Yeah. And, and that's part of learning, you know, in terms of community music, it's part of learning on the job. Yeah, and is being it, generous towards each other and our exactly. colleagues as well. When Generosity, that's a beautiful word, I think, and a beautiful um, definition. I think that's exactly what it is. It's about being generous and um, treating each other with care and understanding. Yeah. Um, and supporting learning. Beautiful, and I think that leads us um, quite nicely onto the next, area that we're going to be looking at where we're going to start thinking about cultural appropriation within this idea of the dangers the potential dangers of what we bring and the quote that you've pulled out for us is musics emerge from people honoring sources instead of erasing them allows for meaningful engagement with different musics feld asserts that appropriation means that the question whose music is submerged, supplanted and subverted by the assertion our or my music. Ethical engagement with multiple musics requires refusing such submersion or appropriation. So what might this look like in a community music setting if we were to unwittingly culturally appropriate something? So I think community music in particular um, does have a bit of a history, certainly with working with musics that fall outside of the sort of white European Western classical art music and popular music realm. Um, you know, we, we have um, strong histories of working with, for example, gamelan or with drumming from different parts of the African continent and with folk song from various regions, etc. And so we need to look really carefully, I think, and seriously at, at how we're including musical practices that come from outside of our own cultural settings or expertise and training um, and look at why 
I think the crucial question there is why we're including them. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of unpack the, the, the excerpt a little bit, because I know there's some jargon, lovely academic jargon in there um, from Feld um, that I had to look up myself. Um, so when we're talking about the question of whose music being submerged, we mean taking that question of whose music is it and kind of attempting to cover up or replace or undermine that question and instead of asking whose music it is turning that on its head and making a what appropriation is is when instead of asking whose music it is you claim it for your own without asking the question mm. um, and that's where you arrive at the the my music or our music um, scenario and we see appropriation if anyone's unfamiliar with it um, we see it a lot, um, for example, where musicians will sample um, and, and effectively profit or um, money or yeah, make profit in some form, financial or otherwise, from including music from other culture or um, in music education or community music. It's where we're using instruments, styles, um, musical practices without contextualising them, ultimately, I think. Because that's the key in terms of the solution is, you know, we have to avoid avoiding, we have to avoid avoiding the question of whose music is it? Yeah. You know, if we unpack who it belongs to, does it belong to anyone? Um, because again, if we think about different cultures and their relationships to music, there isn't the same relationship of ownership mm. either. So there's, there's something there to unpack. Um, but again, it ties in with this idea of intention, because I think there is, especially with kind of increasingly diverse communities of people in schools, elsewhere, um, there is a desire on the part of the teacher or facilitator to include other musics that are maybe more reflective of the classroom or the space and the group they're working with. But um, if it's not done in a dialogue, then we begin to see unhealthy relationships or impacts. Mm. And there um, was a section of the, the chapter that spoke of, that gave an example of this. For example, um, taking a non-Western musical tradition, but then playing it in, for example, a Western orchestral ensemble format. So kind of appropriating that tradition and kind of pushing it into that format. And it seems to sort of, it doesn't honour the source of where it's coming from. Um, and it gives this kind of, um, almost a kind of warped view of this, of what was once another culture's music before it was taken from them. And so it seems like contextualization is absolutely key. Yes. And really kind of setting up that foundation of, this is where this music comes from. This is who it belongs to. We are studying it. We are learning about it. Maybe we're even playing it, but we have to understand the root of it first. Absolutely. For our own. Absolutely. And I think um, the dangers with um, those types of scenarios is that you not only lose the sort of social cultural context, but actually when you take musics that were practiced on a particular set of instruments, or um, with voices and bodies in a certain way, because of course music and dance are very fused in, in many cultures. Um, when you take them out of their context, you're also, when you sort of change the instrumentation of it, you lose some of the nuance. Mm. Or for example, when you take a non-notated tradition and notate it, you lose some of that nuance, that detail, um, and, and some of the, the emotional um, impact of it, but also the emotional meaning of it. Mm. Because music is there in many cultures to be felt. It's an experiential thing. And when we turn it into a product for an ensemble to play and notate it, we are going away from an experiential process of communal music making to a performance of something where rather than it you know it, it's just a it's a different um approach to it um and one that carries a lot of yeah carries a lot of danger yeah mm. and i i think that as you said earlier there's definitely a learning process that has to happen here and like speaking for myself 
I can feel that I, I have to kind of shift perspectives that are kind of entrenched in me from my own music education growing up and really go on a learning journey to start moving on from that and thinking about things differently. Because it was completely normal to, you know, sing a bunch of songs from Tanzania or Ghana in our school choir and not really know what the words meant and not really be 100% sure which African country they came from. And we just have to be careful to not repeat these things just because it was the way that we were educated. Yeah. And think, okay, so how can we be instrumental in starting to make a shift here? And yeah. starting to evolve, move forward, make a change, even though that's not the easiest thing to do because it, it feels much more simpler and less effort to replicate the way we were educated again. Yeah, yeah. and I think a lot of that comes down to the questions we can ask. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, one of the kind of biggest, um, more, one of the more, sort of, to me, visible pitfalls or cases of cultural appropriation that I see happening in music education and cultural and community music is African drumming mm. um, and the sort of the, the use of African as a descriptor that basically suggests that Africa is one homogenous place and a country rather than a continent. Um, and actually what I think we can do and the, the sort of the learning that we can do with that, with music from Asia, from South Asia, East Asia, um, from the Americas is if we learn to ask specific questions mm. we then get more nuanced context and I think the same goes the other way in terms of this the desire to include music from other cultures actually and I don't know how this fits in community music I have to say but certainly from a music education point of view um, where we're perhaps looking at the inclusion of um, European classical music white European classical music and um, thinking about um, bringing other things in or just staying with that because there's a question of well if you don't know about other musics teach what you know but mm. really when we talk about contextualizing it the solution there is to teach it in its fullest context mm. you know there is no issue at all with teaching white European classical music but do so with a proper historical context of what that means um, in terms of who's involved, who's not involved, and what that means for the musical practice, um, and do it in the full co context of naming it mm. as white European classical music, rather than the shorthand music. Yes. You know, so it's it's about that, yeah, context is everything, I think, especially when we think about different cultures and the risk of appropriation, it entirely comes down to context, because there's also many many valid contexts where someone who's not from the cultural background is fully equipped in terms of their knowledge and expertise and experience to use you know to work with musics from cultures that are not their own in terms of sort of heritage and ancestry but if they have dedicated um their work and their life to learning properly then there's no reason why they can't. But again, that's context. Yeah. Because you need to know then that that person has gone to those lengths. And, but, and it's visible in their practice. Mm. But as an outsider to a, you know, a context, if you were to see it on the surface and go, there's a white person teaching West African Ghanaian drumming, that must be appropriation. It's not necessarily if they have gone to the lens to educate themselves and so what I'm hearing there is that so much of this comes down to communication dialogue not making snap judgments or decisions taking time to research taking time to honor a source and yeah I think that seems to be key we were talking about generosity earlier as well and sometimes needing to make mistakes in order to discover things about ourselves and how we need to move forward and so much of it is about being okay with that vulnerability that's required to take a look at ourselves sometimes and think okay what am I actually doing here does this feel okay or is there something about it that actually feels a little bit off yeah. and again that the sense of you know um being able to approach um, situations with openness yeah. and not judging yeah community music practice <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's, it's the yeah. same things it's the same approaches we take 
when we are doing the work yeah. but we just need to apply it to these wider um learning processes yes yeah wonderful okay so i'm going to bring us on to the last section of this chapter that we've been looking at and this is all connected to the limitations of empathy and our quote from the chapter is while empathy often creates connection fosters understanding and remains a valuable goal for music education entering lived experiences of the self and others can on occasion foster empathy unproductively in connection to musics and experiences of unfamiliar others feeling empathy becomes both possible and likely but such feelings sometimes fail to alter oppressive discourses i think this is so key in community music because it, it just entering into a state of empathy is so easily done especially when working with vulnerable people um, and this idea that actually we need to accept our limitations and assess how useful or not it is to be empathetic in any given moment, I think is key to us developing our practice in a positive way. Um, could you tell us a, a few of your thoughts on this, Dilji? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think this comes back um, to what we talked about in relation to the Foucault um, quote as well in terms of music as a human experience because I think in community music we are often trying to make that empath empathetic um, connection and relationship through the music mm -hmm. um, and I think really it's about understanding um, that as much as we want there is a human instinct to find connection through a sense of shared experience um, whether that shared positive experience or, and this is where maybe the danger comes in, shared trauma. Um, you know, it's about, I guess, needing to be aware of when to step back and not try to, I guess, self-involve or co-opt someone else's experience, particularly if it's a traumatic experience. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I, I do some work at the moment um, as a coach for the widening access um, and participation team at the conservatory in Glasgow, which is ironically where we met <laughs> in Glasgow. <laughs> where I met Soundcastle um, back in 2016. And so doing um, that work and, and engaging at the moment in a bit of professional development training work on coaching. And we've been talking about self projecting, mm. which is the idea that we're having a conversation with someone they share something that they've been doing or gone through and our immediate instinct is to say oh I've done that too mm. or I'm going to do that too or I've had the same experience and I think that's something that um, that sort of needs to find a relevance can sometimes make us overstep that boundary of safe empathy if that's mm. a good way of putting it um, in the sense that instead of honouring and supporting someone else's experience our reaction to it is to try and put ourselves in it um, and I think that's something that we can only learn from through, you know, becoming more experienced practitioners. But I think for me, when I think about my research um, and kind of some of the bigger questions and obviously the, the chapter being about the dangers of, of being an activist music educator, for me, this speaks to how we can prepare ourselves to um, deliver um, the safest practice possible. Um, and I think safety is the key word there, is that it's safe for us as well as the people we're working with. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think what this, this is really kind of edging towards for me is about boundaries as well. Boundaries, exactly. And understanding that whilst community music is essentially a social experience and brings us very close to people, we are in fact in a professional working relationship with those people. These are not personal intimate relationships they're professional relationships and so we have to know that there is a limit to how much we can take care of the people in the room with us we are community musicians we're not necessarily therapists we're not doctors um, and i find it very useful especially when working in mental health contexts, to have a frank conversation with the group at the beginning about how music can be triggering it can it can create dangers um and we should sort of think about how we might want to take care of ourselves should those triggers occur 
because as well as us as practitioners needing to be ready for the fact that the music might trigger something in a way we also need to ask the people we're working with to be ready for that as well so there's a sense of everybody in the room taking responsibility for the process and the role that they're playing in the process rather than the facilitator having to hold everyone up the whole time we're asking the people we work with to work in partnership with us for that and mm -hmm. if that if we can make that function there's less need for that feeling of oh i need to make you feel like i can completely relate to your experience by being empathetic when it's not necessarily the right thing to do yeah and i absolutely like this type of thing i think for me is the one the one bit that makes this is where training becomes important because i don't think these are things i don't think it's something i would have been aware of had i not been presented with it in training yeah. and you know to, to name to name it you know and and i think with community music and my experience of obviously i mean i kind of fell into it had no training i know that's a common experience i know that community music sector while it has become more formalized to an extent we've got you know um on the sort of study and research side we've got the international center for community music up at york st john we've got sound castle obviously you're building a community here we've got sound sense and we've got other um sort of forums and things but i think there are i think that's one of the risks of community music more widely is that we are this kind of fairly informal sector and so you will always have pockets of people who are maybe not aware of the support systems or because it's kind of it can become quite a casualized practice that people kind of generally just kind of start doing and building a work portfolio out of that this is where the this for me is the biggest danger i guess is around that safeguarding not only for the people you're working with but also for yourself yeah um because if we don't set these boundaries we then open up the possibility of other people disclosing things to us that might harm us but also the other way around yeah. And I think that's at the heart of it. When you take the music out of it, when you take everything else out of it and make it about an engagement between one person and another, that's the most, that's the fundamental safety, really. Everything else is kind of an aside and can be transferred context to context, but we're coming back to this is a work setting or this is a, to an extent, a hierarchical relationship. And again, community music doesn't like hierarchies. So, but it's about, we need, we need something in order to protect everyone yeah absolutely absolutely and i think that if we kind of think back on the whole kind of course of this conversation we've had today i think there are so many values that we can pull out of it to kind of be taking forward um, from this idea of generosity and moving and like working together as a professional sector and trying to remove judgment from it and understand we're all learning this exactly. idea that there is so little formal training, which means we really are going to have to lift each other up and, and be there to support each other in, in all these different stages of our learning journeys. Yeah. Um, and this idea of how do we kind of get everyone in the room taking responsibility for their own safety. And that includes us as practitioners. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really kind of, that's a really nice point to sort of land the conversation on. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to, to finish off? Anything you'd like to hold on to? I, mean, I think only just in terms of as we think about um, what the kind of the solutions are and the ways forward, certainly at a local level um, within the UK. I mean, I say local, I'm a, a good number of hours away from you right now. <laughs> I'm in Glasgow. But thinking about the UK's community music practice um, and, and thinking about the, yeah, like I said, those different branches, I guess you've got your sort of advocacy side of things, you've got your research and practice and training side of things, and then you've got your workforce, your very vast and diverse workforce. And I think for me, the Soundcastle community really strikes me as a, as a tool and a space. And, and it's a community, it's a community of community musicians that can do exactly what you say. It's about supporting each other because we don't have a more formal structure yeah. and kind of things like codes of practice that really are live and fluid and that we can tailor them to our needs 
um, I think that's just yeah really really important and yeah absolutely and I love that point that actually we're many hours away from each other we're, we're holding this book club from Brighton up to Glasgow um, but with you know with the help of the internet we're all present for each other now and we can use the sound castle community as a platform to voice those vulnerabilities to share concerns to think about how we move forwards and um yeah that's a really really nice point to end things on thank you so much Diljeet. thank you for having me i've loved doing this and and thank you for yeah just inviting me to to pick a great book off a shelf um <laughs> and and just to do a bit of thinking. It's mm. been really, really lovely. Um, yeah, more of this, please. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, we hope we can persuade you back in the future again. <laughs> and um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we have our next book club coming up in September with the marvellous Dave Camlin, who's going to be talking to us all about the Natural Voice Network and the benefits of singing. And um, so we're really excited to have him on. Um, and in a couple of weeks time we will be taking a break from book club just so that i can have a summer holiday um so yes we'll be back in september but thank you everyone for joining us still thank you so much and we'll see you all again soon bye